Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, episode 584. I'm Kevin Coulson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, and this is the 17th of March, which means it's the day we remember the amazing St. Patrick. Don't laugh before the show starts. I, was, I, I wasn't sure whether to make George's joke for him. It's usually better in his mouth. No, 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 no. It's, 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 it's fine. All right. We are professionals. We laugh when we need to. No problem. So, first of all, we want to offer congratulations. You have survived the pandemic up until now. You got to watch episode 583, where we talked about the pandemic in depth with an expert. Uh, if you haven't watched it yet, you should probably watch that before you watch this one. I talked to a Jim Hearn from California. He's an ACNA priest, a lawyer, and has a, a doctorate and wrote his uh, doctorate thesis in uh, the ethics of pandemics. It was a good talk. So before we get too far in today's episode, please like this episode. If you get a chance, subscribe to this episode. If you want to share this episode, and I'll tell you right now, you, you, you're gonna to wanna to share this episode. Copy the hyperlink, send it by email to your friends and family. If you have not commented yet, wait till the end of the episode. Unless you wanna be the first to comment, then you can go run over the comments. But you guys are just amazing viewers. Uh, we read all your comments, we talk about your comments, and it really helps this show continue on. You guys are very knowledgeable, audience in so many different ways and I was able to reach out to Jim Hearn because a viewer uh, pointed me to him uh, to talk about pandemics so thank you so much for all that it's hard to do an intro for this show because we're gonna be talking about some difficult topics topics that are going to be anxiety driven we don't want to do that we don't want to bring any more fear into your lives there's a lot happening internationally and nationally and uh, in your own diocese and in your own churches. Right now, uh, by the time you're watching this, you know some people who are sick uh, and you don't know if it's from the pandemic or it's seasonal pollen or if it's a cold or a flu because you know there's just not, not enough testing out there yet and we're in that fear stage. I am a practicing hypochondriac. When I have a cough, it's cancer. It, that's just the way I am. And there's a lot of people out there like me who uh, suspect the worst uh, with very little evidence. And you are my prayers. We arrive at this show with a lot to talk about because how does a church deal with a pandemic? We're gonna talk about uh, the pandemic and how it affects our churches on a local level and on a national level. And we'll talk a little bit about how it, um, it affects the perceptions of Roman Catholics and Protestants uh, towards the end of the program, kind of a, um, our understanding of the Mass or our understanding of the Eucharist. This is actually our second taping because we had a technical difficulty, but I think it was a great chance to start over. So let's talk uh, on an international level about what the provinces are doing around the world to prepare and help their um, citizens and uh, parishioners. Church of England is obviously going to be in the limelight because Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, usually has an opinion on these types of things and puts out a press release. Gavin, did he put out a press release and what did it say? Well, he put out two. Okay. Um, the, the, first, the first one, if I can summarize, without a pure heart, Lord forgive me. <laughs> the first one really said, wash your hands and be nice. Okay. And, uh, and and there's nothing wrong with that. You do need to wash your hands. You do need to be nice. Uh, anyone who saw those Australian housewives fighting over toilet paper knows that any help to be nice is, is, is welcome. But the trouble is, it, I, I've, if I can advertise for a moment, I've just done, a, uh, I think, one of the most important podcasts of my life, um, with the exception of Anglican Unscripted, of course. Of course. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> Uh, <laughs> How many others have you done? <laughs> <laughs> one, one, I think. <laughs> okay, good, good. <laughs> for, the, for, for the Spectator, which is a, a right-wing magazine, a political magazine, uh, 
and has a podcast called Holy Smoke. And, and the reason I did it was because the uh, the journalist uh, was so underwhelmed by by the spiritual leadership of of Justin Welby with the advice to wash your hands and be nice that he thought that some kind of comment was required on the leadership of the Episcopate in general at a time of crisis like this. So. Um, so, so the first thing is, I think, how do Christians talk about death in a culture where people will do anything not to talk about death? I mean, I, the, the first thing we have to talk about, I think, is is uh, that the church is being faced at the moment with a challenge. Does it believe in life after death? And does it believe in the supernatural? There's a better, you know, there are other words for supernatural, miraculous, metaphysical, arch natural, you know, the other dimension. But at the moment, we live in a secular society which is terrified by death and believes in science and is waiting for a, quite rightly, waiting and hoping for some kind of antidote. Uh, now, either the church says we were joking all this time. <laughs> we never really believed in life after death. and We don't believe in miracles. So let's wash our hands and be nice. Or it says we, we do believe in other things. And this is a very good moment to bring them into play. We might talk about what those things are and how we say it. So, so that was the first thing that the Church of England did. And the next thing it did was to close all its churches for worship. People are saying, well, they can be kept open. So it can, so people can go in and light a candle. And, and, and that's true, though uh, the, 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 the fear and anxiety about germs lasting three days on plastic means, I think, that a lot of people who don't carry around hampers of hand sanitizer with them are not going to want to take those kind of risks. But we'll see. Who knows? They should certainly have the opportunity. Churches should certainly be open well, to prayer here, in the in, sense of the presence. In North America, I was reading a Canadian bishop who was able to meld racism with dealing with this uh, coronavirus, George. And I guess around the world, different provinces are dealing with how to deal with the, the coronavirus differently. Yes, well, we have the Arch Nanny of Canterbury uh, giving the uh, uh, play nicely advice. And I, I have to defend him. It was unobjectionable, but it wasn't really the sort of thing that makes you stand up for Jesus. It mm -hmm. just was, as I say, Nanny's advice. Mm -hmm. uh, fascinating looking at how it's all being done around the world. In uh, West Africa, Nigeria, the Archbishop of Nigeria, Nicholas Oko, has asked that the common cup be suspended, as has the new Archbishop of Uganda and the Archbishop of Kenya. Uh, not to, not ordering, but recommending most earnestly that it be suspended. Uh, Trinidad, Diocese of Trinidad has suspended all worship services. Diocese of uh, Saba, the island of Borneo, has suspended all worship services. Uh, then there are served, then there are dioceses like my diocese, Central Florida, and to my North Florida where the bishops have taken no action and left it to individual parishes. So we're seeing uh, Canada has shut down, uh, Australia is shutting down, the, Europe is shut down, uh, South America is a mixed bag, the Caribbean is shutting down, Africa is, well with Africa actually with their experience of Ebola and other communicable diseases, they actually have protocols in place that they're used to this sort of thing so they don't take the extreme steps that we do because we're unused to these sorts of affairs. The, the, what you were referring to in Canada, Kevin, was the uh, primate uh, of the uh, Anglican Church of Canada and her name just went out of my head. It'll come back. Linda Nichols. Right. Linda Nichols released a statement uh, saying that uh, we need in our approach to fighting the coronavirus or uh, uh, repent of the sins of racism and xenophobia and that racism and xenophobia are our tools in, in first line defense against the coronavirus and I have to say I wasn't disappointed to hear that for because it was such a caricature of what a Canadian Anglican bishop would say uh, you know the old joke about the New York Times with about the New York Times front page world ends tomorrow women and minorities hurt most that's right yeah uh, it's you know coronavirus <laughs> raging through Canada prime minister's wife infected racism and xenophobia are our weapons to fight back not hand washing but racism and, and consciousness training and hiring political diversity consultants that will be the answer so the 
But by and large, the church is taking the unprecedented step, and this really is unprecedented, uh, of suspending the Roman Catholic Church in Italy, the the uh, many of the some of the Orthodox churches, uh, the cops um, are a mixed bag here, are suspending public worship, or they're restricting, uh, they're in, introducing hygiene protocols that change business as usual. And then again, we have the, well, here's the difference. We have the Archbishop of Cyprus, which is its own Orthodox church, putting in protocols, uh, basically ending a common cup. Then we have the Archbishop of Athens, who is the Greek Orthodox Archbishop for Greece, saying that a Greek Orthodox communion is the only true communion. And therefore, since it's the true body and blood of Jesus Christ, it can't carry any germs. Now, there's a little theory about, you know, what are the accidents versus the real presence, all this and that of the world. So, but, so the, the Archbishop of Athens saying, yes, it's perfectly fine for the Catholics not to give out communion because it's not real anyway. But, you know, come to a Greek Orthodox communion and you'll have real true communion and you won't get sick. So we're seeing mosques are closing. Uh, Guj Gujuaras? Yeah, I think that's the word. Yeah. The Hindu temples are closing. Sikh temples are closing. Mecca closed. Synagogues are closing. Uh, in Israel, for example, I, I this I thought this was cute. Israel has put in a no gatherings of more than ten people. So this bride was had a wedding scheduled for this weekend, past weekend, and there's certain institutions that are exempt. Grocery stores are permitted to have more than ten people. So this bride bought the bridal party to a grocery store, and they were married in the produce aisle. <laughs> produce. The only way she could get all her friends to come to the wedding. Well, that's, you know, that's genius as well. So that's the international level. That's how this world is operating with a pandemic. Uh, let's talk about our own experiences uh, in our diocese. Uh, the, the priest was allowed to do what they wanted to do. So in my church, we had morning prayer that was uh, live streamed over the Internet. Uh, we didn't have Holy, Holy Eucharist. We didn't invest. Uh, the priest got into the front of the church and did morning prayer, did a sermon, and I've never had a better attended uh, live stream because the whole church was watching the live stream. They wanted to, to participate in this live. Nobody said, oh, no, there's no Eucharist, uh, you know, the horror. Because I think a lot of people have that knowledge that, you know, in the 1920s and 1910s, uh, Eucharist was not a normal service within the Anglican Church here in America. It was mostly morning prayers, and then once a month you would have uh, a, a Holy Eucharist. I guess that was still something present in the minds because there was not a big freak out about the, the Holy Eucharist. Even here in the Roman Catholic Church, where they've decided to suspend that, not a lot of people were, were freaked out that there wasn't going to be Eucharist available or a daily Mass available. Um, but that's a different reaction around the world. What is your experience with uh, locally in your area, George? Well, we met on Sunday, and I was on Friday. The wardens and I met to put out protocols, and basically it was focused on food handling, mm -hmm. uh, how we would have uh, institute hygiene, hygienic, more hygienic practices, gloves and whatnot, packaged foods for coffee hour and and uh, Lenten suppers and things like that. Then on Saturday morning, the news kept evolving, and I heard uh, some of President Trump's statements. And so on the way to church for our Saturday night service, I stopped at ABC Liquors. And I bought uh, 150 disposable shot glasses, all the go. shot glasses wow. they had. <laughs> and actually, the uh, clerk was quite amused because here's a man dressed in his collar. By th we were must going to have a great party that night. And so on Saturday, and then on our uh, service on our services on Sunday morning, we distributed individual cups. Now we're not Methodist or Lutheran, so I, we had to figure out how to do this. And I was worried because I normally would need 300 cups this time of year. They only had 150, but we were down over 60 percent in turnout. People just stayed away. And some of the, it was rather silly. After the eight o'clock service, I had about a dozen cups left over. And normally you finish and consume all the wine. And it just wasn't that genteel for me to stand up at the altar and do shot after shot of little cups of wine. Well, by the time we got out of church, the president had issued a directive, no more gatherings over 50. 
and we met with the wardens and staff uh, Monday morning and we have closed down for two weeks. I'm going to film daily offices. I'm going to film our, our confirmation classes and our Lenten series. Um, I'm going to film uh, Eucharists. Uh, the office is open, but and we've instituted the same protocols that we do during hurricanes of uh, basically teams of volunteers calling people. And we're encouraging people to stay in because the zone of mortality we are a congregation who could be wiped out sure. if if, the, if we were in northern Italy with the, the, the demographic uh, risk factors. So the for me, this was, I have to say, more emotionally than theologically difficult because worship, and I wouldn't put it so much in the terms of the sacrament, but public worship with, with fellow Christians is an essential part of my identity as a person. And to do something that just was so out of to do be, so I'm so there's of course the technical how do we do this right how do I not make it look phony phony but at the same time uh, when two or three are gathered together does that include over the internet and I, I, I don't know the answer to that so I had to balance prudence with my own if you will gut and emotional instincts the emotional instincts were to carry on uh, but the gut, but the prudence, and one of my deacons is director of emergency services for our county, and he was quite clear. This, mm. uh, you know, I was all gloved up on uh, Saturday and Sunday morning. Uh, I, I was very good. I went and I bought purple disposable gloves so that it all matched my, my stole and sure. everything, so it could be eucharistically appropriate according to the seasons with your disposable gloves. Um, and I'm not joking, I actually did that. That's great. But his, his point was that, you know, even this person, and you may not catch anything, but the person you touch after the person whom you've just touched, you're passing the disease from person A to person B. You're fine, but by not observing strict hygienic protocols. So it was only by the third service or the fourth service of the weekend that I finally figured out how to do it right. And his point on Monday morning was that, you know, we're just playing at hygiene and that what the national leaders are telling us, what the CDC is telling us, is that we can't risk playing. And I bowed to the uh, to prudence. Now, am I happy about it? No, I hate this. I would rather have anything else be but true. But I, in my own mind, I came to the, the understanding that I had a duty to my people that was paramount to my own sense of what was appropriate. Now, Gavin, uh, what were your experiences with the Roman Catholic uh, Mass in England? Well, <clears throat> I first want to say that I agree with every word that George has said, and I think mm -hmm. what he's done is 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 admirable. And in the context, except, he's... except he had a Mass and I had a Lord's Supper. But apart from that, no, oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> tomato, tomato. Well, you know. <laughs> oh, well, let's not go there. We're, we're, we are going to go there, in fact. So I think everything depends, I think, on on one's theological and one's world view. Um, the difficulty is I've I've come to a point in life where I believe in the mass in a particular way. I know I, I you know I never did. I haven't done. So I I don't require anybody else to. But on the other hand, the way I've come to believe in it seems to me to be the way the church has always believed in it. So. Uh, Irenaeus of Lyon talks about the mass as being the the medicine of immortality, and and he doesn't seem to be using it's not meant as a metaphor. Um, and what we have throughout the church's history is a sense of whatever's going on in the mass, it's it's something more, much more than representative, something very tangible. Uh, it took me a while to catch up with what the church has done and believed. I went went to a church in Laziano in Italy about ten years ago. And there was a, a host that bled for the first time in, in the 8th century. And I said, well, what's all that about? That just looks like a crusty old relic. You're saying it bleeds once a year. This is Surely this is, this is superstition. But um, about 10 years ago, they, they analyzed the, the bleeding host uh, because they had started doing this with um, a Eucharistic miracle in Buenos Aires in 1994. And what they found in the laboratory was this host, which was you know, a normal piece of of ecclesiastical cardboard dropped on the floor, which the priest hadn't eaten because it had accumulated too much dust, and he'd put it into a 
a cup of water had started to bleed. And in Buenos Aires, they left it in a cup, sealed cup for three years and then analyzed it. And the lab said, the lab reports are there, it, it had white blood cells and the tissue was of the human heart. Now, part of me says, ew, wait a moment, this is, this is much too close to cannibalism. I don't like this. And if I was constructing a theology of the Eucharist, I wouldn't build in white blood cells and I wouldn't do it. But on the other hand, that's what the science said. So one of the reasons I became a Catholic in time was that having spent 10 years reading about the Eucharistic miracles and thinking about them and looking at the way in which in the last 400 years, Anglicanism and Protestantism has, has reduced what the church believed to something more consistent with our scientific worldview, perfectly proper given how we look at the world in a, in a, in a, in, in a philosophical context, which is positivism and uh, a, a, a scientific context, which is empiricism. You, you only believe what you can measure. Except this really strange thing is suddenly science has bounced back and says, OK, let's measure what happened in the mass. And we suddenly find a miracle. Now, uh, consequently, uh, for me, the, the prospect of suspending this miracle because there are physical dangers attached to it, brings in a conflict of worldviews. And so I have to choose at that point which worldview I want to give myself to. Do I want to give <clears throat> myself being here uh, for another 5, 10, 15 years of sl slowly decaying health as I crumble? Uh, or do I want to feed my soul every Sunday on the living Christ? And I think I'm not willing to compromise feeding my soul on the living Christ, even if it means I have to die next week. What would happen if I died next week? Well, I should have been preparing for that every day of my life. Uh, and in one sense, I've, I've tried to, and I've realized with a shock that the, the coronavirus has made me realize it's a bit like George's hygiene. I've been playing a little bit of preparing for death, and suddenly um, this makes it all the more real. And one of the things that I think quite strongly is that the church has two things it should be expert at. One is facing death, and the other is the supernatural. And, and for both those reasons, celebrating the Eucharist on Sunday suggests a willingness to face physical death and a willingness to commit ourselves to the work of the Holy Spirit in the Eucharist that I want to sign up to. Looking back in the past, I could, I'm thinking of ways, where has this argument happened before that makes us, means we shouldn't argue about the Eucharist because arguing about the Mass is, is, is sterile. And I was thinking about the years of persecution when... Um, because I'm hoping George in a moment will, will use the perfectly proper argument about not putting the Lord to the test, because that applied in the years of persecution too. Uh, you didn't have to go to the lions. There were things you could say and could do to buy yourself some more valuable time if you were committed to the community or the family. But many Christians said, no, we will go to the lions. This is, this is too important. This is our vocation. This is what Jesus is asking of us. And we'll, we'll die this week because we want to go to heaven and we want to be true to him. And in a sense, I think I think that the way in which we celebrate the Mass is, 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 is partly related to that, not to commit suicide, not to catch a, a pandemic unnecessarily, not to be careless, as George has quite rightly said, with other people's lives. That's absolutely essential. But, but if you believe what the Church has believed since Irenaeus of Lyon, then I, I don't see how you can close the doors and stop Mass. And as George quite rightly said, that did happen in Rome, and fortunately they, they changed their mind because I think they were too ashamed of what they were doing. George, I mean, the defense is don't tempt. Well, I don't share Gavin's worldview in theology. Sure. So it, it's, as I said, it's rather sterile to say, no, you're wrong, and here's why, because Gavin speaks from a respectable school of thought. I do not share that school of thought and, and um, to, well and, and I'll, to be honest i don't as well although i well, I, 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 I highly respect course. it you know <laughs> yeah i would come down on real presence and the i've i've known anglican missionaries who were pentecostals who served in chile in the 70s who would tell me about prayer services where they were praying for God's anointing and these Indians from the hinterland would open their mouths and their cavities be filled with gold. I remember those. They, Stamp, they, they, stamped with the sign of the cross. <laughs> it, one, of them, one of them was a bishop, David Pitches, who went back to, I mean, who was, uh, went back to England, was a very prominent leader of the new wine movement. Um, 
I don't doubt his sincerity. Uh, maybe it's because I've worked part time as a journalist for 25 years, but there's so many frauds and charlatans out there. And there's so many people who want this to be true that they'll help it along. Yeah. And I, so I'm not going to comment because I don't know the specifics of any of the instances that Gavin has mentioned. And it would just be churlish of me to say, no, you're not. Yes, it is. Because I don't know. Yeah, but and from a. Th this from a discussion theological... isn't about that. I, I mean, we're not yeah. to discuss that, but I want to discuss. But my perspective is, and it, it also comes from a worldview which is that you don't test the Lord. You don't, uh, there's a tendency in some Protestant churches to do faith budgeting. In other words, uh, we've only had 100,000 in income next year, but we're doing such great work, we're gonna spend 150,000, and God is gonna make up the $50,000 difference because we're really being faithful to the Lord. You see that time and again in immature Christians and in, and in and you see it in the Episcopal Church, and I'm sure you see it in most every sort of denomination people who are new in the faith and believe that the earnestness to their prayers is going to be translated into the blessings of the Lord. I'm not saying that this is a form of the prosperity gospel, uh, but it smacks to me uh, the objections I have to Christian science, uh, the, that uh, the objections I have to Jehovah's Witnesses not receiving blood transfusions that the gifts of science is somehow antithetical to God, I don't believe I don't believe are true. Now I'm not saying I'm not speaking to any instances Gavin has spoken to. But in my particular case, if I had my druthers, I would continue on. Because but I have to ask myself, is that pride? Is that basically saying to God, Lord, I want you to bless me and this church, keep us safe. And I'm not going to get sick. I ha I'm healthy. I'm in the. I'm not in the danger zone. But if I were to wear my gloves and place a Eucharistic host on somebody's tongue, we have people who want me to do that in our church, and I do that, I won't be affected if they have the coronavirus. But the next person whose host I put on their tongue, because I've come in contact with mucous membrane, I will pass it from them to them, from from A to B, omitting me. So the issue comes down to where does my loyalty lie to being true to my own desires or to being uh, faithful to the people whom God has called me to serve? Do I have to be right or do I have to be faithful? And I don't think the two are the same thing. So I, it, I, I'm not I'm not going head to head with Gavin, but I'm, what I'm trying to say is from the perspective I come from, which is a more memorialist spiritualized pseudo Zwinglian not completely Zwinglian but <laughs> it's gonna say I don't think so <laughs> and I'm you know but it it doesn't make any it for for those if you will hardline Protestants who say we must carry on no matter what to me that's pride yeah. speaking that's not theology well, now to be completely frank, if I had Gavin's understanding of the Eucharist, and I believe that, I would be on Gavin's side here. Of course, we're going to have it every Sunday. You know, don't don't be silly. I don't have Gavin's understanding in my life of the Eucharist. Uh, it's a little different. You know, I'm more of a real presence, and um, I will do it as often as we meet together, uh, as God has called us to do. So it just, it's a different understanding, and this is what we watch the church deal with. And I don't mind that this is the, you know, a struggle within the church because it's part of our identity. We should struggle with you know, questions like this you know, because we celebrate and we worship and we offer uh, the church and God and Christ as an alternative to the culture, which right now is full of fear. See, it, for me, we can... The, me, the, the argument that Gavin could make that could flip me was to take it to the Bible, back to the Bible, and Jesus' words of institution in the upper room. You know, this is my body, this is my blood, take, eat, do this in remembrance of me. I don't remember Jesus saying, if everybody is feeling okay. Yeah, that's right. It's in other words, I, good point. In other words <laughs> if, if I heard, if for me, I could be, the tradition argument, because this goes back to Irenaeus, cuts no ice with me. Uh, I mean, I find it mildly interesting. I'm an anti. I'm a, a, a obs obs obscurantist. I was going to say antiquarian, but I like obscure, useless yeah. knowledge. 
Yeah. An antiquarian well, if, obscurantist, George. Yes. George. yes. If, but, if, but, if, but if you can, a pseudo Zwinglian. Yes. <laughs> but if you can take it back to a scriptural reference that can be explained and pulled forward and balanced with the rest of scripture, then I would be persuaded. But again, I, I'm not because I've not seen those arguments. Okay, but so to, to, if I can briefly respond, I mean, John John five, of course, does that, and and, and you thank you for making my case for me in the words of institution, and that is how the church always understood it, and it, uh, and then there's the bit where Jesus says, don't don't be afraid of those who kill the body, but can't hurt the soul, and that that includes viruses as well as political leaders. In the end, I think it's a matter of perception and vocation. If I was George, believing what George believes which is perfectly honorable, I would behave in the honorable way George behaves. Uh, I, I, this I, is so cool. I, <laughs> for my I, beauty. I, I, for, for, most, for most of my life, I shared Kelly, Kevin's very balanced position. I'm slightly <laughs> embarrassed. <laughs> I'm, I'm slightly embarrassed to find myself <clears throat> being linked a little too closely by George with Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, and others, but I think the answer Christian to that scientists, is Christian science. Christian science. Well, okay. okay. It's more, it's more biased, but but, yeah, I, just... I, but I understand what George was saying because you know when the devil perverts things, he takes what is real and he gives it an extra twist out of shape. So the people who are really crazy are going to look quite real. Like they're, they're going to have a certain amount in common with us. It's just they've twisted it too far. Um, I, I think in the end we have to be faithful. To Jesus at whatever stage of the road we're on. I mean, the church the church had this big problem over persecution in Augustine's day, and it led to the Donatist crisis, when a number of people said we we weren't ready to give up our lives. You know, we had responsibilities. It wasn't the moment. All kinds of honourable reasons. You know, why should I give the Romans the, the satisfaction of killing me for no particular reason? It's only absolutely. Push, but, you yeah, know, that's it, we, I, completely understood. And I think in the end. How do we deal with our differences? We say, well, um, what we're called to do is to be true to Jesus from where he's brought us in our journey. And that, that, that's, it's as simple as that. And having done that, uh, I can say to George, George, please do make sure those hygienic gloves are the right liturgical color. It would be awful if they weren't. And George can say to me, uh, if you're in a position when you're taking the host on the tongue, don't touch the tongue, because he's right. <laughs> on the other hand, George, they don't touch the tongue. So you don't come into contact with the mucous membrane because that would be selfish. And the traditionalist bishops are saying, please take it in the hand. Uh, and here's what you do with your hand to do it. So what we should help each other avoid stupid mistakes, I agree. Uh, and then perhaps this is an opportunity for fresh calibration. The, the, the whole of the rest of our society is looking at itself. It's going to have to learn something about death. I think this is a moment for evangelism. Right. I think Christians should say, it, we're not afraid of dying. We're going to be with Jesus. We'll take precautions, but bring it on. This is, you know, this is life and death and new life. The history of the 20th century is so instructive in how we understand these things. I, some of you may know, I used to write, I wrote for the Jerusalem Post for about five or six years, and therefore I knew a lot of Jewish people writing for the Jerusalem Post. And I came to know an editor quite well whose father survived the Holocaust. He was Polish. The, the, the man's father had been brought up in a <laughs> by cats. <laughs> really? Now? <laughs> he had been brought up in a shtetl in a Hasidic community, and he was one of these boys who left who left the village and left his faith. And one of the things this and he survived the war by being a partisan in the woods. And one of the things he said was that when the Nazis came, he went to his father's village. His father was the rabbi. And he said to his father, you know, father, we must flee because here's what the G G Nazis have been doing in Germany all these years. They're going to do it to us, too. And uh, the father's response was, well, this is the sign that the Messiah is coming because things are so horrible. We should celebrate and rejoice because this is, uh, you know, the mark of the end times. Well, the, the son didn't believe it and he hid in the woods. He survived the war. Every member of his family was killed. And I'm not trying to equate Gavin's worldview with the Hasidic rabbi in 1939, but Quite there's nice, a though. but there's a there's a tendency. I don't want to say romanticize, but there's a but I see it as a tendency to test God that by my faithfulness I shall be saved, when the reality is not always the case. Now, one I want to circle back to something else, and 
uh, we talked about the Archbishop of Canterbury's response, which which I dubbed being the Arch Nanny of Canterbury. One of the one of the uh, uh, residual effects of this uh, cancellation culture that we're now in is uh, the former Archbishop of Canterbury, Lord Carey, was going to come spend a week with us next month. He was going to spend April, uh, April 20th to 27th. Baptisms, confirmations, we had all sorts of confer- it, it was going to be a big show. And he's in his mid-80s, and as of Friday, we were still going to go forward. Then President Trump closed the borders, and then Prime Minister Johnson said, everybody over 75, stay at home. And so we corresponded yesterday, and the Archbishop of Canterbury, George Carey, wrote to me saying, I can't come, and for all these reasons. He said, but George, I want you to go forward because this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to share the good news of Jesus Christ. People are scared. People don't know where to turn. And we need now to stand and speak and carry forward the gospel. This, if I were right, if I were wrong, if I were Justin Welby's speechwriter, George Carey's little missive to me should have been what appeared in the Daily Mail. Yeah. Not this, not this hand washing, gargle, rinse, spit stuff that um, Justin Welby was giving you. Well, not- in, in many terms, people see this, and, I, and this is what when I read Justin Welby's uh, statement, I'm like thrown back to the movie Apollo 13, where the guys at the chalkboard saying, "This is how we got to do it. This is how we're going to save the the uh, astronauts from a certain death." And there's one little engineer that I think was, this is horrible. We need to back up now. Uh, they're going to die anyway. And we just can't do it. We don't have the gumption. And the, the leader of NASA says, no, this is going to be NASA's finest moment. And this should be the church's finest moment. We should be representing Christ. We should be coming against fear, coming against anxiety, coming against doubt. We know what happens after you die. We know and we have the faith to present it to you. And I don't see that coming from the churches. This should be the finest moment. This is when the church and its people should taste like salt and be the light on this dark earth. Gavin's friend, Damian Thompson, had a tweet yesterday where he said there are thousands of fantastic Anglican and Catholic priests are doing the right things right now, but there's not, I'm paraphrasing, not a single Anglican or Roman Catholic bishop in Britain who is measuring up to their clergy. So when you say the church is falling short, I, I, I would say the church leadership is falling short. And at, that's my default as a journalist is when I speak of the church, I oftentimes am referring to leadership uh, Anglican TV exists because of poor uh, Anglican leadership. So that that's my default. Um, this is Tuesday. We have another five days. Right now, the number of infected, according to the uh, uh, John Hopkins graph, is 200,000. Uh, it's clearly going to jump to 400 and then uh, double to 800. And then a million people will be infected. Uh, Please don't let that be your fear. Let this be your opportunity to express your faith. Right now, there's people in your neighborhood and in your church who are afraid, who can't go grocery shopping because they think they'll get a disease. It's our opportunity to help shop for them. It's our opportunity to serve the people who are most at risk from this disease. This is a place where the church should shine. We have opportunities to pray for people and uh, to start praying for the the people who uh, we find are ill. You're going to know by the end of the week three or four people close to you who are ill, not seriously sick, not in the hospital, that's uh, a less of this demographic, but this is a chance to offer them encouragement through your faith. May May I drop it down from this high note to a more mundane note? Gavin, you, you, your ear is closer to the ground in Britain. Uh, we speculated last week about the Lambeth Conference, uh, a gathering of men and some women in their mid to late 60s 
on a university campus drawn from all over the world. Do you think the government will, or the, the University of Canterbury, Kent to Canterbury, will tolerate this? Do you think, what do you think is going to happen? Have you heard anything? <clears throat> Um, as I haven't heard anything, but as Kevin said, things are moving very fast. There isn't any way at all it's going to happen. It'll be cancelled. Yeah, I think so. Uh, because people are talking, they're talking not only about the next <clears throat> situation lasting. Uh, so, so the periods of time are uh, everyone isolates for two weeks. Uh, this situation of not meeting in public is going to last for three months, 12 weeks. That takes us close enough. Uh, it's not going to have been managed by then. There won't be an antidote, they think, for 18 months. Uh, the latest there's a very good paper written by Imperial College, which I've been reading, which suggests that uh, we had better get used for the situation we're in to last for some time, 18 months, really. Uh, I can't, th there will be no Lambeth conference. Um, it, it's scientifically and sociologically and politically impossible that a gathering like that could take place, even if the airlines were in a position to ship people from A to B, which they're not anymore. I, I, when we had our meeting yesterday, we also went through the financial repercussions. Uh, my, my church is okay. Uh, we can survive a shutdown, which, it, which will, we're estimating we're going to see a sharp drop in giving uh, during the during the closure. I would say most Episcopal churches, except for those that are well endowed or who are healthy, uh, they live paycheck to paycheck, and I think we're going to see. Uh, a culling of uh, marginal parishes and if the income dries up uh, I think the Church of England is even a more precarious financial situation and the bishops if they're going to if the bishops don't have the time or the income are not going to have the time or the income or the inclination <clears throat> to talk climate change and mosquito nets when their backs are against the wall financially in three months well, it, <clears throat> and it's going to be worse than that George we're going to have a very large worldwide economic recession this time the banks won't go bust, but but in terms of uh, the economic health of the societies we live in, uh, we're going to go through a purgative period shortly. So it won't just be travel agents and airlines. Uh, a lot of people are, I think, going to find the next 18 months really very difficult. Oh, um, yeah, go through the list. Tourist, hotels, uh, cruise lines, airlines, uh, big restaurants. We have restaurants all up and down Milford here who will not be able to sustain their rent by just having uh, takeout. There's going to be a, a big repercussion economically around the world. Uh, and this is prosperous New England. I can't imagine what it's going to be like in other places wh which aren't even close to prosperous. What are rents going to be like in San Francisco in two months? That's going to crash. So, And, you know, Florida, this is these, this, April, March, April, May, we derive half of our income uh, from the calendar year because it's the height of the season. Um, we're about, we're shutting down right now. It's like Disney World shutting down right now. It is catastrophic financially. The beaches in Fort Lauderdale and Daytona Beach are free from college students. Uh, you can walk around and not step in throw up and not be molested by drunken 19 year olds which is probably nice, but at yeah, the same but time, the economy is t taking a tank. Well, mm -hmm. One of the things I did, I felt like Mr. Chamber of Commerce, I said, friends, if you've got the money, start now getting your car fixed or having your patio screen fixed. In other words, spend money locally to keep our small businesses in operation. Because if we, if we sit on the cash that we do have, we're going to shut down the economy so much faster. So if you can, Jill, Prime the pump yourself. Don't just wait for the government to do it. Yeah, Jill and I made a list of the restaurants we're going to, eat, to dine out at or do takeout at every night this week. Uh, there's just so many nice places we don't want to close. And we made a list, okay, Tuesday we're going to have Bonfire. Uh, Thursday we'll have Sea Breeze. You know, we even like Chipotle. So, you know, uh, Wednesday is Chipotle. Chick-fil-A is Friday. I don't know, Friday feast. I don't think they have fish. Well, we're going to have to suffer by not having fish on Friday and Lent, but that's something we're going to take for the team. You know, this pandemic is not just financial. It's not just a mental uh, thing. It, it's it's something that's spiritual as well. And I've always said the church has the answer. It's time that the church has a wonderful chance here to step up. 
Well, Gavin, I'm very fearful for the Scottish whiskey industry because Episcopalians in the Northeast have been told to stay at home. And basically, they'll put the distilleries out of business in a month if they stop consuming. <laughs> Pennsylvania closed well, liquor stores. Pennsylvania closed liquor stores? Well, there's always New Jersey. That's right. <laughs> Our secular society is having its bluff called uh, death and, and disaster uh, are stalking us and one of the things that we can do as Christians uh, is help people face their despair and their hopelessness um, and, and, and experience the risen Christ who's preparing them for eternal life. This is a practice run. We're getting ready for eternal life and then you know when, when the ground underneath us gives way here um, the ground around our, our souls grows even stronger. Uh, people will want to hear that. They'll be more ready to hear it now than they were when they were just planning the annual holiday. Yeah. As the mortality increases and people see how they can't control this, if this is outside of their control, uh, they're going to look for other answers. And we have one. I'm Kevin Carlson. I'm George Conger. I'm Gavin Ashenden, enjoying the practice run and holy conversation. You've been listening to episode 584 of Anglican Unscripted St. Patrick. We need a bit of your your chutzpah, your courage and your prayers. Pray for us. And let's pray for one another. Amen. Amen.